Chris Killam is known internationally as the medicine hunter. He's a, a committed, uh, lifelong advocate and activist on behalf of uh, plant medicine and wisdom altogether. And he's just a dynamic speaker. If you haven't heard him yet to, uh, this weekend, you will hear it now. Please give him a hand. So one of the things that I, I think we've probably all noticed is that you can't come up with fiction to match the weirdness of reality. Uh, this piece in the news, for real, unembellished, there's a report out from the Vatican from their chief exorcist, okay, and his team, because the Vatican needs lots of exorcism, so they have to have a whole team to do it. And they've noticed a global uptick in demonic possession. And it is due primarily to two things, which they gleaned through their occult powers. Number one, watching Harry Potter movies. For real, this is in their report. And number two, practicing yoga. So all you demonically possessed, very flexible Harry Potter viewers, get thee behind me, Satan. In a way, um, first of all, I want to say I am, I am awed and impressed and grateful for everything that has happened here over the past two days. Uh, Stephen and Selena have done an, an immensely wonderful job with their team putting this together, and the other speakers have contributed so diversely and so richly with such brilliance and genuine heartfelt love and care and a real desire to share, I just want to give everybody the big hand that they deserve. And even though the talk I was going to give seems kind of like a little bit of inappropriate right now, I'm going to go ahead and give it anyway, because otherwise I'll just be standing here smiling and feeling grateful, and you don't need that. Um, it's, it's called uh, Down the Rabbit Hole. You know, we've had a lot of talk about healing. We've had a lot of talk about um, all the good, wonderful things that can happen. And there are also some strange things, and, and maybe if you kind of like thought them through a little bit more carefully, uh, less than perfect things that can happen with psychedelics. And so I've sort of uh, divided this into three primary groups. Uh, one is doking, uh, doking, not doking, that's dosing actually. Um, <laughs> I don't know what doking is. <laughs> the second category is regrettable acts. And the third category is grifters. Uh, I want to start with the first category of dosing with a little story. It was 1984, it was the opening day of the Olympics, and through a friend, uh, my girlfriend and I, who were living in Venice Beach, California at the time, were going to go to a gigantic mansion on Sunset Boulevard that, oddly enough, was exactly across the street from Olympic Village. We couldn't get into Olympic Village, and we couldn't get into the Olympics, so we were going to watch the Olympics on TV. But close enough that you could throw a baseball at the Olympic Village if you had that kind of an arm. And uh, so we were kind of excited about this. It sounded like fun. Our, our friends were house-sitting for God knows whoever owned this palatial spread, certainly nothing we could afford. And a friend of hers came over uh, a few days before with this great big monster bag of mushrooms, big bag. And he said, look, I've had these in the freezer for seven years, <laughs> you can kind of figure where this is going. And he said, and I have absolutely no idea if they're even any good anymore. But here you are, you know, you, you sort of like this kind of thing, so I'm giving them to you. And I said, well, thank you very much. Uh, so the morning of 
the uh, before we went over to the Olympics, I did the only safe and sane and intelligent thing. I only ate half of them. <laughs> Chopped them up, put them in an omelet, and then went out to wash my car. <laughs> and about 45 minutes later, my girlfriend found me out there watering my car, just laughing and laughing and having absolutely no idea where I was. And we went over, to, I was, so then from that point on, I was in custodial care, okay? All, I mean, I could still perform the basics, I could pee by myself and all that kind of thing, but everything else was just plain beyond my capacity. And so, uh, and, and we brought the remaining half a bag of mushrooms over, and the seven other people that I spent the day with divided these equally, and they all madly tripped all day long. And I just kept repeatedly throwing myself in the, the swimming pool because I thought it was so funny how my body just dissolved like sugar every time I did, like, wow! <laughs> and then somebody oddly asked me to play tennis with them, and I don't play tennis anyway, but I was like, yeah, sure, man, okay. But the racket had this huge hole in it, and no matter how accurately I swung, the ball just kind of magically went through it. So really, uh, would it have, I mean, it turned out to be a great day. It turned out to be a great day, actually, so I can't say, oh God, this was an awful, awful, awful dosage mishap. But it certainly was a dosage mishap of sorts. Uh, years later, I found myself uh, down in Peru uh, at an ayahuasca center, um, and we were going to have a private ceremony with this particular big well-known shaman, and it's just a few of us, just a few of us. Uh, there were ceremonies on a regular basis throughout the week at this place, but this was a special set-aside. Now, there were four Russians in there, and, and I just, it, it, they looked, um, if you were a cartoonist and you were going to draw Boris Yeltsin and his family, this is what they looked like. They looked primary like potato and vodka fed, and um, they were big, and they came bursting into the maloka before a ceremony started because they're like, well, we're not going to be left out of this, even though they sort of weren't invited. And we'd all been given the advice ahead of time. Somebody said, whoa, the brew is so strong, so strong. Just take it really, really easy, okay? Just do a little bit. So we all agreed, okay, we'll just do a little bit. But not the Russians. They're like, we didn't come all the way from Minsk to drink a third of a glass. So they all got the full glasses because they insisted, uh, including one who actually truly did look like Boris Yeltsin's double, okay? So they're sitting on one side of the, uh, they kind of hunkered down. They, they didn't, you know, they were explained there was a private ceremony and they just like pretended at that moment they understood no language at all. So they sat down, they had their full glasses. Uh, we had our quarter or thirds of glasses. The ceremony started and, and at a certain point, very quickly, it all became about them. Um, it was without question the most operatic barf session I have ever heard in my life. <laughs> and these are big people. These are big people. Two guys, two women, and they were just all big, and they had, like, tremendous lungs. And, um, and, and, for, those of you, and for those of you who have drunk ayahuasca and have purged, then you know that it, it's never demure. Like, there's, there's almost nobody in ceremony who goes, that's, it's, it's this, you know, when you are, when you're getting demons out of your colon through your mouth, <laughs> this is, uh, as uh, Carlos Castaneda's Don Juan would say, this is a magnificent affair. And so they began, I actually have a recording of this. My wife Zoe won't let me play this in the house. Uh, I had a recording of this ceremony, which, it, which it, it didn't wind up actually being a ceremony because it was just too absurd, because they had taken too much of this way too strong ayahuasca. So there was just hours of the just this. And you know how it is ahead of time 
before people puke in ayahuasca, they do this. <laughs> and the tongue kind of wags back and forth like this. <laughs> and then afterwards, they sort of sit back, you know, and the sweat is pouring down their faces, and then it starts again. So this went on forever. And then this one guy who looked kind of like a professional wrestler and was sort of a little scary tough looking, decided this was the perfect time for him to take off all his clothes but his little Speedo underpants. <laughs> Fine, man, this is, the, this is the ayahuasca experience you are having. <laughs> and then he got up and started doing muscle poses around the maloca. All of them, for hours. And, and if you have been at these ayahuasca centers, you know that anybody who's on a diet is like really skinny, okay? So a couple of these been dieting forever really skinny helpers of the shaman got up and tried to get this great big brawny muscular Russian wrestler type guy to sit down and he was having none of it so they kind of came back to their mats like that's not gonna work that's not gonna work and then finally at one point the the I'm in my speedo underpants guy decided that it would be a great idea to lie down on a guy who was on his mat and that went very very poorly the guy actually kicked him and then somehow he managed, the, the Russian guy just kind of like managed to go like, oh, okay, like, wow, I'm in an ayahuasca ceremony here. I'm in my underpants. And he went very quietly back to his mat and we heard nothing more of them except the occasional barfing, which continued just like forever. So we didn't actually have a healing ceremony. We didn't actually have our sort of real true private time with this special shaman. We just kind of hung out while one guy did muscle poses and while the four Russians puked their faces off. And that's really about dosage. So one of the things that's... <laughs> I always at some point, if I can remember, try to circle back to the point. I think that's very important. Otherwise people left hanging like, why is he talking about a guy in his underpants? I don't get it. So one of the first things that, that can go wrong and that you need to get right is your dose. Um, some people can, can do heroic amounts of psychedelics. There was a man at a conference that I was at, uh, or I guess he was here last year. He does 15 or 20 grams of dried mushrooms. That's what he does, because he likes to have the experience as though he's just smoked DMT, but it lasts for 10 hours. <laughs> okay. This is a professional mushroom eater. Do not try this at home. So one of the first things that we have to get figured out, whether we're consuming peyote, we're consuming mushrooms, we're consuming LSD, we're consuming ayahuasca is, what's my dose? And, and I'm going to try to offer some principles and thoughts here. The, 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 remember this, you can always take more. You can never take less. <laughs> it's not like, well, you know, like I drank three full ounces of that really intense ayahuasca, but, you know, come to think of it, now that I'm getting off and I'm already being swallowed by a gigantic jaguar, I just want a third of a glass. That doesn't work. It doesn't work. So as you go along, one of the things you have to figure out is your dose. Moving on to regrettable acts. Um, not all visions are wise. Okay? I mean, just, I, I told you yesterday, for those of you who are here, I see these guys with tomato can heads. There's nothing like beatific about this. I haven't learned anything from these guys except that they're sort of weird and annoying. Um, but okay, they come up. I'm certainly not going to like uh, assume that they are now my prophets and worship them, the guys with the tomato can heads. You have to know what visions are just stuff kind of, you know, passing out of your brain. 
Uh, Zoe and I were in Iquitos. If you know about Iquitos, and many people here have spent lots of time in Iquitos, Iquitos is to the ayahuasca scene in Peru what uh, Rishikesh was to the yoga scene early 1970s, okay? Uh, so many people going down there, participating in ayahuasca ceremonies, centers springing up all over the place, shamans popping out of every street corner and, and sewer grate, and just <laughs> in general, this kind of like whole thing exploding, good, bad, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And, you know, people go and they have their experiences, and the good news is that most of the experiences are positive. And the good news is that there is a lot of healing. And the bad news is some people never come back. We ran into a guy, an exuberant guy, a wonderful guy, a friendly guy, who was in the process of getting his entire body from the waist up tattooed with a tableau of ayahuasca. So he had the jaguar, he had the snake going across his back, he had the vine curling up his arms, he had toe blossoms all over his torso. I promise you, he's gonna regret those tattoos at some point. At some point, maybe when he's 50, maybe when he's 60, he's gonna look in the mirror and say, why the hell did I do that? Um, his idea, as he explained it to us, was that he wanted to represent the medicine, and representing the medicine is cool. You can do that a lot more ways than indelibly tattooing all the pictures of the plants and the shamans and the, the stuff on your body. I'm not saying tattoos are bad, I've got a couple of them myself, but when you're going to do something that's permanent, it's always a good idea to wait. Sometimes people come out of the ceremony and they say, I'm going to go home, quit my job, divorce my whoever, and I'm going to shave my head and become, I'm going to wander the earth like Cain in Kung Fu. Okay, my best and strongest advice is wait 60 days. And then if it seems to be a smart thing to quit your job, divorce your whoever, shave your head and wander the earth like Cain in Kung Fu, okay, but wait because it may turn out that that was a lousy vision, that that was a bad idea, because not all of these visions are wise. One of the best examples of that, and sort of heartbreaking in a way, was the very well-publicized example of Julian Haynes. A British man went to Iquitos, drank ayahuasca, and did what anybody in that situation would do, decided to build a gigantic wooden pyramid on the Rio Ataya. And I mean gigantic, five stories minimum, absolutely immense. This thing bobbed around in the river for years. It became the number one attraction in that particular area of Peru. Everybody would go to Iquitos to see the pyramid. And it was to be a world peace center. And it was to be a center for healing that would have every healing modality in it. And it was to draw healers and mystics and yogis and, and teachers from all over the world. And none of that happened, of course, because it was just at the end of the day, this gigantic and very, very expensive wooden pyramid bobbing up and down in the Rio Ataya. And storm after storm after storm hit that over the years, and finally it just started to fall apart, and then people did what they do with free wood. They took some of it, they built houses out of it, they started fires with it. Today that pyramid's gone, and he spent about a million bucks and was that a wise vision? No, it wasn't a wise vision. It may have been well-intentioned, but see what happens in the medicine that is deceiving. Two things. Number one, everything is amplified. Everything is amplified. And, and you get this extraordinary sense of things. And it is entirely possible to imagine yourself and your experiences disproportionate to the reality of the world around you. And it is also entirely possible to be inspired by ideas that have no foundation in reality, no foundation at all. And so even as we go into ceremony, even as we engage with the medicines, 
we still have to keep our wits about us. Many of the rules by which we live on our day-to-day -day basis are suspended in the spirit landscape. It is entirely possible, we know from listening to people who speak here, that you can carry trauma and heartbreak and difficulty and suffering for years and try one modality after another and go to chiropractors and acupuncturists and essential oil people and Reiki masters and this and that and do yoga and Zen retreats and you're still carrying this bag of shit behind you. And then you go drink ayahuasca or you go eat peyote in a Native American church ceremony or you do the mushrooms or something and sometimes even in a night this may be resolved. That's completely outside of the rules. It's, it's not as though gravity is suspended, but things can happen rapidly. The unexplainable can happen. I took a friend down to the Amazon. He had chronic fatigue syndrome for four and a half years. He'd done everything conventional and non-conventional. Nothing worked. Two nights. Gone. Any doctor will tell you, except for Joe, any doctor will tell you that's not possible. It's possible. It happens. But after you go through those experiences in ceremony where the rules of the phenomenal world are temporarily suspended and the spirits work on you and you get this healing, you still wind, wind up back on planet Earth. And so maybe tattooing your entire upper body with representations of the medicine isn't the best way to represent the medicine. And maybe spending a million bucks building a five-story wooden pyramid on the Rio Ataya isn't actually the way to go. Maybe there are other ways to go. So as we have our visions, there, there are a few tips. There are a few tips here. One is if as a result of a vision, you come to determine that you are the chosen one, <laughs> know that it isn't true. <laughs> know that it isn't true. If you have a vision, and in that vision, the ayahuasca or the peyote or the whatever speaks to you very clearly, and tells you, you are the prophet to bring this whole thing forward. Don't believe it, because it's not true. The whole notion that we carry from these bizarre, perverted religions, isms, ologies, and osophies that only steal money from the poor and break people's hearts and cause endless global suffering, we get this idea of a Messiah. Okay, somebody's going to come save our sorry asses now that we've messed everything up. We don't have to do anything because we're all going to be saved. Plainly bullshit. Either we are all the Messiah together, all working this through, all intentionally moving forward in a humane, compassionate, thoughtful, loving you know, peace engendering way, or it is not going to happen. And there's nobody in this room, there's nobody outside of this room, there's nobody we ever heard of, there's nobody showing up down the road who's going to do it. If that whole crazy cockamamie conspiracy theory were even half right, for the last 2,000 years we'd be living in peace. There would have been no wars. There would have been no genocides. There would have been no people being massively cruel to each other in grandiose ways that make the history books. It all would have been settled. If at any time at all your visions cause you to imagine that you are somehow greater in any manner at all, disproportionate to others, check it out because it's never true. All of the real healers have said the same thing. You can only go forth with humility. 
and imagining, imagining ourselves at any point in time to be the one. It doesn't mean you can't do things. You can say, you know, I'm, I've really determined I'm going to help, you know, work against hunger. It's a noble cause. It's a very noble cause. Everybody deserves to eat. But not, I'm going to be the one who ends world hunger because it's not going to happen. If you're willing to, you know, there are people who go down to Iquitos and they drink ayahuasca for three nights, four nights, five nights. Maybe they do a two-week tour someplace and they say, I'm going to be a healer. Okay, but I have yet to hear anybody come out of that situation and say, you know, after drinking ayahuasca or doing the peyote, I've determined that I'm going to spend the next 10 years devoting myself to the hard work and study uh, that it really takes to learn the skills to possibly, eventually, be capable enough to be that kind of healer. Nobody says that. There are some people who do it. But that's not what happens as a result of this hyper-exuberance. We do get our healings. We do get positive experiences. We break through things that have held us back maybe our whole lives since we were just tiny, tiny creatures. But that doesn't mean that we are bigger than anybody else in any manner whatsoever. And this leads us to the last part of the down the rabbit hole equation, and that is choosing teachers. Beware the teacher who's mysterious because they are a grifter. The real teachers are never mysterious. They're just straightforward. My friend Alejandro, Don Alejandro Alfaro, he's a, he's a shaman in, in Lima. He dresses like Tiger Woods. He always has like his Under Armour shirt and his sort of natty golf pants on and his, and his hat. And you could just mistake him as kind of this cheerful guy. But he does something that's 100%. It always happens. He goes into a room. He winds up with a group of people. He hangs out. We all do whatever we're doing. And when he leaves, everybody says, wow, who was that guy? I feel so good just being around him. That's his healing gift. It's only if you ask, uh, if, only if you say, hey, like, you know, Alejandro, where did you learn what you learned? He'll tell you, but he never talks about himself. He just shows up and does the healing. That's what he does. I had occasion um, many years ago to spend three weeks, just three weeks, with this wonderful Swami. Veda Vyasananda, this very sweet man. He had, turned out he was in charge of the entire Swami order in India, 500,000 monks. And this was a sweet, sweet, loving man. And I'd get up in the morning about 4, 4.30 and make tea for him. And we'd sit out, just sit down on a carpet and talk. And I would take him for drives. Very funny guy. He'd get into the car and he'd go, bind me, which meant put his seatbelt on. <laughs> And then we'd get to the wherever, and he'd go, unbind me now. <laughs> and I'd say, Swamiji, you can do this. He'd go, no. It was just flat out, no. But in my time with this man, I thought, you know, if I could wind up half as loving and sweet as this human being that I'm traveling around with, I would consider my life very, very well spent. Beware of the person who says, I'm very powerful. We have uh, some people in our, in our area in Massachusetts who are, uh, you know, they call themselves witches and, and warlocks, and that's cool. You can call yourself whatever you want. But I've met some guys who say, I'm very powerful. And I say, great, show me your power. <laughs> and they say, it doesn't work that way. Well, you can take the words that way out of the equation. It doesn't work, period. <laughs> Question these people. If you're, going to, if you're going to take psychotropic substances in their company and they're going to guide you, for God's sake, make sure you know who you're with. There's a guy outside of Iquitos, his favorite trick. He's a shaman, okay? He's trained. He'll be in ceremony. With, uh, the next day he'll say, I saw something about your mother. She's very sick. 
I can do a special ceremony for her to make her well. It'll cost you $400, but I know it will work. And the gullible pay him the money, and the others just go, oh, God, you know, get out of here. There are the shamans who are gropers. Let me just say very clearly now, there is no shamanic vulva massage. <laughs> a, shaman, a shaman touches you, do the right thing. Slap them in the face, call them out right on the spot in ceremony. Shame the crap out of them. I love the magic as much as the next person, maybe more. I keep going back for these things of great reverence and love and respect for this. Um, there's a shaman I, I really love. Her name is Estella Pangoza. She has uh, what she calls hummingbird medicine. So when she sings, there's this kind of trembling of her voice. It's, I can't do it. And it's just exquisite. And she doesn't really talk about herself unless you ask. And she'll say, oh, you know, I got a little bit from here and there. But she just puts all of her time and all of her energy and all of her attention into showering you with love and letting the love do the healing, letting the plant spirits get to you and opening those pathways for that. And there are so many more who do that. So I would say in this very brief time that I have up here, um, when you engage with these agents, these change agents, which really are revolutionary, which are transformative, which are healing, which are completely remarkable, keep your wits about you. Keep your wits about you. Don't tattoo your entire upper body. <laughs> Don't build a $1 million five-story pyramid on a river. That's just dumb. <laughs> Seriously. We have to call it what it is. And don't go into ceremony and go, I've done a lot of psychedelics. Give me, give me a double shot of that stuff. <laughs> no, no, no. You can always have more later. The first time I drank ayahuasca, um, the shaman said to me, you know, look, he gave me a dose and he said, he said, if you don't feel it, you can have more later. And, and those of you have heard this before, an hour later I was lying on my back sobbing, just laughing at the idea that anybody in this world would drink more. <laughs> I was being pummeled by a gigantic psych psychedelic anaconda the size of a tractor trailer. I was like not in need of more ayahuasca. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Beware of the teacher who says, I want you to forget everything you know and suspend judgment. Because no wise, smart, high, loving, caring teacher will ever say that. They will say, use wise discrimination. Use what you know and try to understand the situation you're in in terms of the Dharma in terms of the path, in terms of the fundamental goodness of the spiritual journey. So I want to, uh, before I introduce Kateri, I just want to say that um, I have tremendous uh, appreciation for this group. Um, I love being in a room full of Argonauts. It takes a lot of courage to engage with these medicines. As, as Shane said last night in his wonderful uh, comedic act that he did, you know, talking about the, the ludicrous notion that these things could be addicting, that, you know, when he sits down, it's a, it's a fight for him. He's looking at the mu mushrooms with trepidation, okay? This isn't, oh my God, now we have created craven mushroom addicts. Not likely or craven ayahuasca addicts. Pretty improbable, really, when you think of it. You can only puke so much. <laughs> I have some people would challenge that theory. Uh, some people, like, you know, way after everybody else is done puking, 11 o'clock, midnight, they're still going at it. I don't know what reserves they're drawing from, <laughs> honestly. But I would say that if we take all the knowledge that we have, 
and the understanding and all the basics of safety. And we question the people in whom we are going to entrust ourselves. We will fare very, very well. And if we leave all of that out and just kind of take a flyer, things can go terribly wrong. Uh, it's been my great pleasure and privilege to be here with you. I want to thank Stephen. Before I introduce Kateri. Okay, okay. So I, I'm not going to introduce Kateri, and he's going to get his thanks out of the way. Um, so I will just say to you, it's been a pleasure, it's been a privilege, an honor. I'm deeply grateful for this opportunity, and I can't thank you all enough. <laughs>